Welcome to week four of the Faith Refined um, Bible study, Faith Refined, how God uses hard things in our life to refine our faith. Um, this week, we're gonna talk about um, a topic of endurance and perseverance, and we're gonna jump right in. And I'm gonna use as an opening illustration um, some information out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. So it's a book written about those who have um, actually given the ultimate sacrifice and given their lives for the sake of the gospel. And the reason I wanna share this with us is because I want us to remember that when we study the words of men like Peter and Paul and James and our core text, James chapter one, consider it all joy, my brethren, that when we study these New Testament writers, we are learning from individuals who had learned these lessons and they were speaking from a place of experience. And when they call to us to endurance, it wasn't just that they were encouraging us to endure and get through a trial and get to the other side and live happily ever after, but when they called the first century believers to um, endurance and perseverance, and also us through en to endurance and perseverance, they knew that for them, persevering would probably mean the end of their life. And so I don't know about you, but when I study from someone who has that level of experience, that level of commitment, that level of um, fortitude, then I take their lessons more to heart. And so we can trust that as we study this week, um, we are learning from um, kind of the masters of what it means to live a life of endurance, um, allow God to tr transform our lives and our faith, and how to persevere during trials, okay? So this is from the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it just starts with the first martyr, which was St. Stephen in the Gospel of Acts. And so we know that from that account that Stephen was taken outside of the city, city and he was stoned to death. James the Great, who is one of the sons of Zebedee, so James and John, and James the Great was beheaded. Um, Philip was thrown, was scourged and thrown into prison and afterwards crucified in AD 54. Matthew, the tax collector, one of Jesus' 12, was slain with a halberd in, the, in, eight, in AD 60. And a halberd is a, like a six foot long pole with an ax on the end of it. James the Less, the believed to be the brother of Jesus, he met his martyrdom. Um, he was beaten and stoned by the Jews. Mattathias was stoned in Jerusalem and then beheaded. Andrew was crucified on a cross that had been transfixed in the ground, hence the term St. Andrew's Cross. Um, Mark, the gospel writer, was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria. Peter, we've re read through several of Peter's epistles and through several passages, he was crucified with his head down and his feet upward. Um, and record has it that he was crucified that way because he didn't consider himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner of Jesus. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, gave his neck to the sword. Jude was crucified in AD 72. Bartholomew was cruelly beaten and then crucified. Thomas was thrust through with a spear. The apostle Luke was hanged on an olive tree. Simon was crucified. John, the writer of the gospel and first, second, third John and the writer of Revelation was cast into a cauldron of, of boiling water. He escaped by miracle without injury. And then he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And he was the only apostle who escaped a violent death. And so we know from this account that um, as we study the words of these men, we can trust that they knew what it meant to endure and that it wasn't a, uh, like a temporary call to perseverance, but it was a lifelong pursuit of perseverance and endurance, especially in the midst of trial and persecution. So we're gonna jump in today and we're gonna be in Hebrews chapter 10, one of my favorite passages. And if you've heard me teach on endurance before, I've taken you to this passage. And so we're gonna be there today. And um, I'm just gonna read beginning in verse 32. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Remember the earlier days after you had been enlightened that you endured a hard struggle with suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions, and at other times you were companions with those who were so treated. 
For you sympathize with the prisoners and accept with the joy the confiscation of your possessions, because you knew that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confidence, which is a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what is promised. For yet in a very little while, the coming one will come and he will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. But, verse 39 says, we are not of those who draw back and are destroyed, but we are of those who have faith and are saved. So we're gonna talk through that passage. We're gonna walk through it all the way through to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, but this passage is so important when talking about us developing a spirit of endurance and perseverance. And as we get started, I just want to kind of define what per perseverance and endurance um, means and give it a definition. So to persevere is to, pers to persist in anything undertaken, to maintain a purpose in spite of difficulty, obstacles, or discouragement, to continue steadfastly to hold out against, to sustain without impairment or yielding, to bear without resistance, to bear up under pressure, to support adverse force or influence of any kind, to suffer without yielding, and to suffer patiently. So as we are kind of going through this text and we're being challenged to perseverance, that's what endurance and perseverance means. And so we're gonna take a look at this text. And the first thing that we learn is that the writer of Hebrews is encouraging the first century Jewish people who are being persecuted under the Roman emperor Nero. And Nero was famous for persecuting the believers. And he, um, when he went so far even as to burn the city of Rome um, in order to clear space to erect a palace and, um, and buildings and monuments and, and idols and statues to, to himself, and when he began to um, take be pr pressured from those around him for burning Rome, he blamed it on the Christians. And um, historians tell us that Nero's persecution of the cr Christians was very extreme, and he would even um, put them in clothing that had been covered with with oil and with with tar, and would light them on fire to light his gardens at night. And so the writer of Hebrews is writing to this group of people, and he's writing to these um, Jewish believers and telling them that you're going through these trials and I want you to persevere. And the first thing he does is he says, remember you have, you have persevered in the past, that they themselves have struggled greatly, that they've been exposed to taunts and to um, turmoil, that they've suffered and that they have partnered with others who have suffered likewise. So not only do we want to endure for our sake so that we can endure to the end of our suffering and to the end of our trials and tribulations and so that we can go through the process of having our faith refined, but we also want to endure because we want to endure with those around us who are likewise going through trials and difficulties. This life is not about us, and our endurance ultimately is not about us. It's about us developing a spirit of endurance that we might endure and glorify God, but also that we might come alongside our brothers and sisters and endure with them. And so he compliments them and says, you've endured a great hardship, you've endured, you've even walked with those who have also endured great hardship, that you've sympathized with the prisoners and you've accepted joyfully. Remember, that's our, our word from the very first um, week and lesson that we had, that you've accepted joyfully even the confiscation of your own property and possessions because you know that you have a better possession. And so once again, and we'll see it several times during today's lesson, um, Perseverance requires that eternal perspective because as they lost and as the things on this world got harder and harder and harder and they suffered more life in the physical world, they trusted that they had a better heavenly possession, that there was a future stored up for them that would be absent pain and suffering. So first of all, we learn that although they had suffered well, um, the writer of Hebrews says this in verse 36, but 
you have need for endurance. In other words, the suffering that you've done in the past is amazing and God's used that and he's been glorified in it, but we're not through this yet. And so we want to persevere with a spirit of endurance. And as I've shared in the workbook, you know, my general, my MO for getting through hard things is usually just to put my head down and run toward the end of the hard thing and get through it as quickly as I possibly can so that I can go back to living a safe and secure and comfortable and easy life. Like, that's just my MO for going through difficult things. And when my mom was diagnosed, for the first time in my life, I wasn't in a hurry to get to the end of it because that would only mean one thing. And that was that my mom had lost her fight with cancer. And so I really prayed that the Holy Spirit would teach me how to endure well, how to enjoy, how to endure with a spirit of joy, and how to finish strong because I wanted to give that gift to my mom. I wanted to endure strong for her benefit and to carry her to the end of her life with a spirit of strength and endurance and perseverance. I didn't just want to hurry through and get to happily ever after, but I wanted to endure well. And so we see that the writer of Hebrews tells these first century believing Jews that they too had the need for endurance. So we know that we have the need for endurance and he says that there is a promise and a reward for those who endure. And listen to what he says in verse 37 and 38. And this will be reminders of what we've learned in the past. We've learned about the importance of having an eternal perspective as we endure trials. It'll also talk about the importance of faith and the refining of our faith as we endure various trials. So listen for those words as I read reread these two verses. So verse 37, for yet for a little while, the coming one will come and he will not delay. Daughters, the coming one is coming. The coming Jesus is coming. And it says that he's coming shortly in a lit, in a very little while and he won't delay. And these words were written over 2000 years ago. And so we can trust that that coming one, the coming Jesus and his arrival back on the earth to restore all things to their created glory, he's coming and he won't delay. Even if time passes, it's not the savior delaying, but he is coming and he won't delay but the righteous one must live by faith. We can't live by sight. We have to live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will have no pleasure in him. Remember last week when we looked at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if we shrink back during our times of greatest need, as if we shrink back during advers um, adversary and difficulties and trials, it says that God has no pleasure in those who shrink back. So ladies, we don't want to be counted among those who shrink back. And the writers of Hebrews wants to encourage his original audience and us, and he says, but you're not of those who shrink back. Ladies, we are not among the company of those who shrink back. And we don't have the spiritual heritage of people who are known for shrinking back and for, um, for giving up and for not finishing strong. We are among a company of believers who have been following Jesus Christ for over 2,000 years, and that company of believers are not those who shrink back. We come from strong spiritual stock, and it doesn't matter what your, your biological um, and spiritual history is, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you follow him, you are not those who shrink back, but you are one of those who persevere to the end. And it says that there are basically three options that we have when we are going through difficulty. And we're not of those who draw back. We are not destroyed, but we are of those who have faith and are saved. And um, I've made an alliteration out of those because that's just how my mind works. So when facing trials, we can respond in one of three ways. Either we can run, we can try to escape the trial and we can try to avoid it. We can try to go the other direction. We can numb ourselves. We can self-medicate. We can do some of these things so that we can, in a sense, run away from the pressure that's being put on us from the difficult circumstance that we're experiencing. So first thing we could do is we could run. 
The second thing we could do is we could allow it to ruin us. It says that there are those that when they shrink back, they are destroyed. And so, ladies, I know how how tempting it is to allow the things and the pressures and the weight and the difficulties of this life to be so heavy upon us that it feels as like they may actually destroy us. But we're not of those who shrink back. We're not of those who are ruined by the circumstances in our lives. So we don't want to run. And we don't want to live in such a way that our faith is ruined by the difficult things that we go through. And so the third option is that we can remain under the pressure. We can remain under the weight. And when scripture talks about trials and difficulties and, and hard things, it uses this sense of weight. And so, and we'll see that in a minute when we go to Matthew chapter 11. But to endure a trial is to have this added weight and pressure, almost as though there was a physical weight on our shoulders. And that's what trials and difficulties do, is it adds this weight on our shoulders. And a spirit of endurance is saying, I don't wanna run from this weight. I don't wanna just cast it off and run from it. I don't wanna let this weight ruin me but I want to remain under, I want to gain the spiritual muscles that will allow me to remain under this added weight and pressure as I endure to the end of my trial. And that's really what a spirit of perseverance is, the ability to bear up added weight and pressure to the end. Um, and if you've heard me teach on endurance, you've heard this illustration, but when my son was in high school, he played water polo and Water polo is a grueling sport. Um, it's almost like basketball, but it's played in a pool of water that basically has the bottom of the pool so deep that the swimmers can't touch the bottom. And so you literally have to tread water for four quarters in a water polo game. And um, basically what um, your conditioning and your training is at in high school when my son was in, in water polo was the coach would just basically have you develop the strength and endurance that you could tread water for hours on end. And one thing that he would do is he would add weight to you so that not only did you have to hold your own weight up and not drown just by treading water, but he would add weight to you and that weight, you would have to develop the muscles and the endurance and the ability to hold that added weight up in the pool. And that way that when game day came, you were used to having this added weight on you so that when you played without those weights, you could play with great freedom and strength. And one day I was picking my son Austin up from water polo practice and he and a buddy were in the car and they were complaining about practice because it was grueling. If you've ever seen um, a man or a woman on a water polo team, you know that they are cut because the, the training is so grueling. And so they were complaining about water polo practice and, um, and my son was, you know, complaining that he'd been, the coach had given him the weight belt and so he'd had this added weight and he'd had to endure practice with this with his weight belt and his friend said that the coach ran out of weight belts and so he grabbed a poolside chair like one of those metal chairs and um, Austin's friend had to just um, tread water and hold that metal chair up over his head as he treaded water, trying to keep his his body above water and try to keep from drowning. And so, you know, these two boys were talking about how difficult it is to endure through a practice as this added weight is placed on them. And, you know, I just asked my son, I'm like, Austin, how do you keep from drowning? And he said, Mom, you just don't stop swimming. I, If you know Nemo, you've heard that from Dory, just keep swimming. And my son said, That's that's the only way we can do it. There's no other option. Like the option to run isn't there. The option to get out of the pool and give up isn't there. The, the option to be ruined isn't there. That would mean certain death and drowning. And so he's like, mom, the only, the only course of action we have is to just keep swimming and to be able to develop the strength and endurance to bear up that weight that the coach has placed on us. And so when my son said that, I the Holy Spirit really used that to remind me and to teach this lesson of endurance and perseverance. And that's what it means to develop a heart and to allow our faith to re be refined to a point that we can bear up under this added weight and pressure. And a couple days later, 
I was picking the boys up at water polo again, and this time their tone was very different. And I and um, they were Austin. This time was super excited that the coach had given him the weight belt and that he had been able to wear the weight belt during practice. And I'm like Austin, like two days ago you were complaining about the weight belt, and now you're acting like wearing the weight belt is a privilege. Like what's up with that? And he said, Mom, that means that the coach is going to start you on Thursday's game. He gives the boys that are going to start the weight belt because they're the ones that need to be conditioned at a higher level because they're going to be able to start the game. And I thought about that and he said, so it's really a privilege to be given the weight belt. And you know that the coach believes in you, that he trusts in you, that he knows that you can handle the added weight and he knows that you're going to be able to perform under pressure when game time comes. And once again, I was so struck by the spiritual truth that is found in that, that we can trust that as added weight and pressure is added to our lives through trials and difficulties and adverse circumstances, we can trust that we have a God in heaven who is equal to the coach in this analogy, who when he sees us with this added weight and pressure, and sometimes when he even gifts us with trials and difficulties in order to build spiritual muscles into our lives, he does it not because he is a cruel father or a cruel coach, but he does it because he believes in us and he knows that he wants to put us into the game. He wants us to be able to do the job that we've been called to do when, day, when game time comes. And he knows that we are developing the strength and ability to bear up under that added weight and pressure. And so I hope that's a word for you today, that if you feel as though you've had this um, pressure put on you, and maybe even you feel as though God somehow added that pressure to your life, trust that as a good father, he's done so because he believes that as we build spiritual muscles and and as our faith is being refined, we will be able to bear up under more and more and greater and greater pressure and we'll have the ability to be sustained to the end. So this passage is such a beautiful reminder and that illustration is such a beautiful picture for me of what it means to live a life of endurance and perseverance. So we have the need for endurance and perseverance. Um, the only option when we are called to live a life of endurance and perseverance is to remain under this added weight and pressure. And then the writer of Hebrews launches into Hebrews chapter 11. And some of you might be familiar with this chapter of scripture. Sometimes we call it the great hall of faith because because in verse 39, the very last verse of, verse of chapter 10, he says, but we are not of those who shrink back and who are destroyed, but we are of those who have faith and are saved. And then after he says, we're of this strong spiritual stock, like we come from strong spiritual families and ties, then he reminds us of those who have gone before us and who have lived by faith and have endured to the end and have trusted God's promises, even though they didn't always publicly experience them or experience them in their lifetime, but they knew the fulfillment of that promise was coming. And so they had that future hope. And so he launches into this great um, chapter on those who have walked by faith. And, um, you know, I'm just going to read through a little bit of it. I won't read the entire chapter, but. I just pray that uh, maybe even you want to close your eyes. Maybe you want to just sit in, under the ministry of the word right now and be reminded of those who have gone before you. They were not of those who shrink back. They were those who endure to the end. Um, and so chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 1. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not yet seen. For by it our ancestors won God's approval. By, we, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he did not experience death. By faith, Noah built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, when Abraham was called, he obeyed. By faith, Sarah herself received the ability to conceive the seed of promise. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance. They greeted them, and they confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed Esau and Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith, 
Joseph mentioned the Exodus. By faith, Moses was hidden in the reeds for three months. By faith, when Moses had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the king. By faith, he instituted the Passover. By faith, he crossed the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab did not perish with those who disobeyed. And verse 32, and what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith, Listen to this, they conquered kingdoms, they administered justice, they obtained promises, they shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the raging of the fire, they escaped the edge of the sword, they gained strength and weakness, they became mighty in battle, and they put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead and raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, men of whom the world is not worthy. And they wandered in deserts and on mountains, and they hid in caves and holes in the ground. Listen to verse 39. All of these were approved through their faith. But they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. And so we learn from that. That's our spiritual heritage. And so we know that we don't struggle alone. We don't endure alone. That we have surrounding us this great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us in faith. They have gone before us trusting by faith and not by sight. They've gone before us having an eternal perspective. They've gone forward with this ability to endure to the end and to finish strong. And then in chapter 12 of Hebrews, um, it says this, therefore, so all of this that the writer of Hebrews has talked about, because of that, therefore, because we have been called to endurance, because we have suffered well, because we have a, a, a long heritage of those who have persevered by faith, therefore, we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he now sits at the right hand of the Father. Consider him who endured such such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary or give up. So the writers of Hebrews ends this kind of chapter and passage of scripture to call us to do four things. And I think, ladies, as we persevere and as we endure, this is the practical things that we can do. First of all, he says, remember. So because we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and so we can remember those in the faith, we can revisit Hebrews chapter 11, and we can read their stories, especially in the Old and in the New Testament, and be reminded that we are among those who have historically walked by faith. And we need to look back in our own lives and remember the times that God has been faithful to carry us through difficult times. And that past tracker, track record of the faith Faithfulness of God will give us the ability to endure in the current moment. So first of all, we remember. And then he says to lay aside, so to release the encumbrances. And that word that's translated encumbrance there is weight. So release the weight that's been added on us and the sin that so easily entangles us. So first we remember those who have gone before us and we remember God's past faithfulness. We release the weight. And for this, I want to remind us of Hebrew of Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus calls us to come. And he says, come all who are weary and heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he encourages us and he says, learn from me and take my yoke for my, my burden is easy and my yoke is light and you will have rest for your souls. And so, you know, I was always kind of confused by that passage in Matthew that God, that Jesus acknowledges that we are weary and heavy laden, 
that we've had these extra weights laid on us in this life. And then he tells us to take up something else, this heavy yoke. And that never made sense to me until I heard it um, preached on recently. And so if you have two oxen that are muzzled together basically with, with a yoke, and there's two holes for the head of these two oxen to go through, in each of those pair, there is a lead ox. And the lead ox is older, he's stronger, he's wiser, he's developed the, the muscles and the ability to carry added weight. And so you had the lead ox, but then you also have the learner. And that is an ox who is paired with this very mature ox who can bear a lot of weight and who can, who can carry a lot of weight and do a lot of heavy lifting. And so you have this learner that is put into the yoke with this lead ox. But despite the fact that I know the learner feels like there's a lot of weight, that it's actually the lead oxen that is carrying the majority of the weight. And so the lead oxen puts that on his shoulders and it's he that carries the majority of the weight as the learner can learn what it means to, 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 to be yoked together so that they can learn how what it means to carry a heavy burden, so they can learn how to 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 go forward and to do the job that, that they've been called to do. And so in Matthew chapter 11, we're reminded that Jesus is that lead ox, that he's the one that when we are yoked with him, when we bring our burdens to him and we put them in the cart behind Jesus, those things that were too heavy for us to, to bear, we, we throw them aside, we put them in that cart that Jesus is willing to carry Harry. He puts his head into the, the yoke as the lead ox, and he carries the abundance of that weight for us. And even though we're there and we're called alongside Jesus, and likewise, our necks are in a yoke, and there is a heavy burden behind us, but we can rest assured that when we come to Jesus and we put those trials and tribulations and difficult things in the wagon behind him, and we yoke ourselves to him, we can trust that although our our weight sometimes feels overbearing that we can trust that we have King Jesus who is operating as the lead ox and will carry the majority of the weight for us and when we begin to stumble he will keep that ox cart up and running he will carry us through to the end and so we have to remember we have to release that added weight and pressure and put it onto the back of Jesus and then we have to run, we have to run with endurance. And once we have, have yoked ourselves to Jesus and once we have um, thrown that weight on him and when he is carrying the, the, the majority of that burden for us, then we can run with greater strength. We can run with almost a lightness of spirit because he is carrying the burden for us. And ladies, I know as you, the longer you go through a difficult thing, it is a daily and sometimes moment by moment to decision to come to Jesus and to surrender that weight to him and say, Jesus, I can't carry this. You have to carry this for me or it will ruin me. So we have to run with endurance. And then it says that we have to refocus and we have to refocus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Um, and once again, this is a day-by-day -day thing. It's a moment-by-moment -moment thing. We can get so distracted and our focus can um, transfer to the things of this world and the difficulties ahead of us. And so constantly we have to refocus our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And it says that Jesus had a future focus. So he had an eternal focus. He didn't, he didn't look at the cross. He looked beyond the cross. So it says that he looked at the cross before him and he did it with joy and he endured the cross. He despised its shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. So Jesus didn't look at the cross. He looked through the cross. What was on the other side was exaltation and glory and power and dominion forever and ever and ever. So as we go through and endure our hard things, of course we look at that hard thing, but we look through it and we look through it to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, trusting that there is a reward and a victory on the other side, that Jesus is bearing the weight for us. He is giving us the ability to have our faith refined so that we have spiritual muscles to bear up under added weight and pressure. And we just need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And then, you know, that last verse that I read, um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse three, for consider him, that's being Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, 
And so why do we consider Jesus? So that you won't grow weary and give up. So ladies, that's my prayer, that as we keep ourselves focused on Jesus, and as we allow him to teach us what it means to endure, may we not grow weary or give up. Amen? Amen.